The Art of Optimism, Your Competitive Edge, by Jim Stovall. I'm your narrator, Rich Germain. Chapter 1, Reintroducing Optimism. Winston Churchill said, A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. As you hear these words, I want you to know that I am greatly honored. I realize that you have many choices in how you spend your time and money, so I'm grateful you have chosen to let me and my message through this book become a part of your life. As a young man, I never intended to be a writer and wasn't even a reader. When I could read with my eyes, as you are doing within the pages of this book or on the screen of an electronic device, I don't know that I've ever read a whole book cover to cover. My pursuits were much more focused in the arena of athletics as opposed to academics. After losing my sight in my 20s and living the last 30 years as a blind person, I have averaged reading a book a day thanks to audiobooks and high-speed digital players. Becoming a reader made it possible for me to become a writer and has opened so many other doors in my world. I'm hopeful and expectant that this book will do the same for you. Having read thousands of books, I realize some books are entertaining, others are informational, and a few are literally transformational. I am dedicated to the proposition that this book and the act of infusing optimism into your life will become transformational for you and everyone around you. To this end, any time the message of this book seems distant or hard to apply in your life, you can contact me directly at jim at jimstovall.com. For over 20 years, I have written a syndicated weekly column known as Winner's Wisdom, which appears in countless newspapers, magazines, and online publications all around the globe. When you send me your questions or challenges via email, feel free to request the weekly Winner's Wisdom column, and it will be sent to you every Thursday at no charge as my ongoing commitment to your journey of optimism. For several years, I have done a weekly national radio show every Monday. I also do a local radio program in my hometown, which is hosted by my friend and colleague, Pat Campbell. Pat is fond of saying, he who controls the definitions controls the debate. I believe this is true in world politics, late-breaking news events, and how you and I structure our lives as we move toward success. I have reviewed a number of dictionaries, and among the most common definitions of optimism is a predisposition or tendency to look on the more favorable side of events or conditions. If you study a bit deeper into the definitions and origins of the terms predisposition and tendency, you will find that in the modern vernacular these terms denote something that is already set in place or prearranged. While elements of your physical self, such as being tall or having blue eyes or being left-handed, may be predetermined by genetics, I maintain and am committed to the concept throughout this book that whether you are an optimist or a pessimist is totally in your control and may well be the most important decision you will ever make in your personal or professional life. I have written over 40 books to date and have been a part of seven of them thus far becoming movies. I have written over 1,000 columns, made countless speeches for millions of people, and have appeared on a myriad of TV and radio shows discussing all manner of topics. I firmly believe that the journey of exploration you and I are taking within this book to explore optimism and how it impacts us may well be the most important topic I have ever tackled. In a famous Supreme Court decision involving pornography, one of the justices declared, I don't know if I can define it, but I know it when I see it. While you and I may have never thought about the precise definitions of the words optimist or pessimist, those words undoubtedly evoke images of people from your past who you think of as optimistic or pessimistic. Zig Ziglar was a great friend and colleague of mine. He impacted my life as well as the lives of millions of people around the world. His legacy of influence will continue through his books, videos, and audios for centuries to come. 
Zieg often said, I'm an optimist. I would go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me. I knew Zig for over two decades, and I never saw him in a bad mood or portraying any emotion other than absolute optimism. When I began speaking at large corporate and arena events, where a number of speakers were booked onto the same program throughout the day, I crossed paths with Zig Ziglar many times. You would be surprised how often the backstage preparations for positive thinking rallies and motivational events are far from positive or motivational. I remember one particular day when the crew setting up an event had not been allowed into the arena at the time called for in the contract. There were an inordinate number of difficulties with the lighting, sound system, and computer setup backstage. Just as the frustration, confusion, and utter chaos reached a boiling point, Zig Ziglar arrived backstage and proclaimed to everyone within shouting distance, It's great to be here, and this is going to be an amazing day. One of the overworked, overstressed technicians turned to Zig and said quite sarcastically, Well, you're sure in a good mood today. Without skipping a beat, Zig smiled broadly and declared, Yes, sir, I'm in a great mood today because, over twenty years ago, I decided to be in a great mood today. That encounter has stayed with me for many years and began my thinking about and studying of optimism, which has culminated in this book. I read dozens of personal development books each year. One of the most fascinating titles in recent memory is Malcolm Gladwell's book, the Tipping Point. In his book, Mr. Gladwell shows how small ideas, thoughts, or trends can become wildly popular and morph into something that impacts society as a whole. If you read The Tipping Point, like me, you will be convinced that the concept is valid and tipping points occur. The question you may be left with, as I am, is, can we create, influence, or encourage a tipping point? If so, that power or ability becomes a tremendous tool. If not, it is little more than an interesting phenomenon to observe, much like the weather or the orbit of the planets. Within this book, you will be convinced not only of the power of optimism, but also of your ability to control it in every area of your life. Socrates lived in Greece almost 2,500 years ago. He was a revolutionary teacher and philosopher. The true impact of someone's life's work can only be fully examined in hindsight, and as one of my favorite authors, Louis L'Amour, often said, no person can be judged except against the backdrop of the time and place in which they lived. Socrates' teachings were quite profound, but when you understand that his work became the basis for the teachings of Plato, Aristotle, and all other great thought leaders who came after him, it becomes clear that Socrates was transformational. His concept, now known as the Socratic Method, a series of questions and answers that evoke self-discovery, is the foundation of what we now know as a university education. In many of my arena and corporate speeches, I stand on the shoulders of Socrates as I encourage and create a sense of expectation with my audience as I implore them Please do not miss the power of this message due to the weakness of the messenger. I am not someone who has arrived at his destiny, but instead I am a fellow traveler on the road to success. I do not have the answers you are seeking. I do have some questions that will be the framework for our time together, and you will discover that you already have the answers you seek. Among Socrates' most profound ideas was his statement, an unexamined life is not worth living. It is easy for us to reflect upon the news of the day and everything going on around us, but rarely, if ever, do we delve into that last great frontier inside our own minds, spirits, and souls to examine who we are, where we are going, and what do we stand for. Our thoughts control our actions, and our actions result in the way we live our lives. As I always tell my audiences in corporate and arena events, you can change your life when you change your mind. 
A key missing element in the process of changing our mind is to examine the lens through which we view the world. We can never overcome the images we see through the lens, but through a process my friend and colleague Dr. Stephen Covey called a paradigm shift, we can change lenses. Optimists and pessimists can live in the same environment and encounter the same situations, but their individual lenses offer them each a completely different reality. I'm reminded of the two shoe salesmen who lived and worked during the beginning of the 20th century. These two salesmen worked for the same company, and the company had decided to open a new market for their shoes in the South Pacific Islands. The president of the shoe company called the two salesmen into his office and informed them they were both being transferred to a remote South Pacific Island. The first salesman, we will call Oscar the Optimist, enthusiastically proclaimed, what a great opportunity and wonderful adventure to get to move to a tropical island and sell our shoes. The second salesman, we will call Peter the Pessimist, muttered, You've got to be kidding. I can't believe they expect us to move to some backward island in the middle of nowhere and try to do business. In the coming days, Oscar and Peter made preparations for the big move. Oscar whistled while he worked told all his friends and family he would be sending them wonderful cards and letters, and he eagerly awaited the departure date for his voyage to the South Pacific. Peter was dejected and depressed. He delayed making any arrangements or preparations for the move until the last minute, and then finally, in frustration, he threw a few belongings into a bag and rushed to the port to catch the boat for his dreaded departure. As the great ocean liner's horn sounded, indicating they were leaving the dock for the three-week journey halfway around the world, Oscar and Peter settled into their cabins. Oscar found his accommodations to be efficient, convenient, and excitedly rustic. Peter found his identical cabin to be cramped, uncomfortable, and primitive. During the twenty-plus day voyage, Oscar toured the entire ship and learned many new things about sailing and navigation. He met a number of interesting people on board, some of whom became his lifelong friends. And he wrote notes and postcards to friends and family back home, describing his wonderful voyage and big adventure. Peter remained mostly in his cabin throughout the entire voyage, and only ventured out for meals. He avoided other passengers and all the onboard activities. His only interaction with the ship's crew was to lodge a number of complaints about the ship, the food, and the weather. After more than three weeks at sea, the ship arrived at the South Pacific Island where Oscar and Peter would begin their new careers and their new lives. As the two salesmen walked down the gangplank from the ship to the dock, Oscar was refreshed, invigorated, and filled with great anticipation. Peter was exhausted disoriented and filled with dread. As Oscar and Peter strolled into the port city, they discussed how they would divide up their new sales territory, which was made up of the one tropical island where they had just arrived. Peter groaned, I'm not going one inch farther. I'll take this into the island and you can have the other side. Oscar readily agreed, thinking it would give him a chance to explore the entire area and find a suitable place to live and work on the other side of the island. Peter, the pessimist, shuffled down the street and entered the first dockside rooming house he could find. It was dirty and run down, but it was what he expected, so he agreed to rent a small apartment on the ground floor. He closed the shutters, drew the drapes, put out the Do Not Disturb sign, and went to bed, thinking, I need to take a couple of weeks off to recuperate from that interminable trip before I begin trying to sell shoes in this ridiculous, godforsaken place. As Oscar the Optimist left his colleague Peter, he looked around the port city with great excitement, taking in all the exotic sights and sounds and smells of his new home. Oscar caught a train to the far end of the island and sat in a window seat so he could enjoy all the scenic views of this marvelous tropical island that he had been blessed to be assigned to. While he thought he might be tired after the long train ride, Oscar found himself to be surprisingly rested and refreshed as he looked over the town at the other end of the island where he would work and make his new home. 
Oscar enthusiastically toured the area, meeting as many of the inhabitants of the town as he could. After all, they were going to be his new neighbors, and he was ecstatic that everyone was so helpful and friendly. After considering all his many options, Oscar rented a seaside cottage that had a breathtaking view of the coastline and offered a ringside seat to savor the amazing sunsets over the ocean each evening. While Peter listlessly lounged around his gloomy and cluttered apartment, Oscar energetically set up housekeeping in his new seaside home and arranged to host a party so he could meet all his new neighbors. Peter avoided all the residents of his apartment building, as he was certain they were all thieves and ne'er-do-wells, while Oscar discovered that his neighbors were some of the most fascinating people he had ever met. Some of Oscar's new neighbors were world travelers who, after experiencing every environment around the globe, decided to settle on this particular tropical island, while other neighbors were native to the island and saw no reason to leave paradise for anything else that might be across the ocean. Peter's dread increased, and his negative attitude grew throughout his two-week self-imposed vacation before he planned to start work. Oscar used the occasion of his party to begin introducing new friends and neighbors to his line of shoes that he was very proud to be bringing to the island. Oscar felt no reason to take any time off as he enjoyed his job and never really felt like he was working. After all, he thought, it's only a matter of sharing these great shoes with new friends and neighbors who he was convinced would be as excited about his products as he was. Peter and Oscar could not have had more different views, impressions, or opinions of their new island home and worksite. But they discovered one thing immediately that they could agree on. Virtually all the native inhabitants of the South Sea Island where they had been sent were barefoot. It seemed that no one wore shoes. Barely a month after Oscar and Peter had their meeting with the president of the shoe company, they both sent a telegram back to the home office. Peter, the pessimist, telegram read, To whom it may or may not concern, finally arrived in this dirty, impoverished, out-of-the-way place and discovered that no one here even wears shoes. Therefore, I am sending back all inventory and will be returning on the next ship that will get me out of this place. Oscar's telegram to the office of the shoe company read, Greetings from Paradise. I am both thankful and grateful that you have sent me here. It's like being able to live in a tropical resort and pursue my profession at the same time. Just when I thought it couldn't get any better, I discovered the most amazing thing. No one on this island wears shoes. It's a completely untapped market. Please send all available shoe inventory to this island as soon as possible, as I am convinced this will be the most outstanding market for our shoes we have ever experienced. Oscar and Peter experienced the same conditions and environment. All factors were identical, but their perceptions and their results were polar opposites. The only difference between ecstatic success and abject failure was that Oscar was an optimist and Peter was a pessimist. Neither one of them could have changed their job assignment, travel arrangements, or any of the conditions on the island. But each of them had within their power to change their outlook, and that alone made a world of difference. As a blind person myself, I have a keen understanding of the concept that bad things can happen to good people. As I tell my audiences when I speak, however, my blindness is no more or less significant than someone else's divorce, bankruptcy, illness, or unemployment. We are all only as big as the smallest thing it takes to divert us from our higher calling and destiny. Many pessimists do not even believe in the concept of optimism, much less their own ability to convert to a better way of thinking and living. But just as if they didn't believe in gravity, it still exists and influences every element of their lives every day. Sometimes, those who do not believe in optimism can come to an understanding of its existence by recognizing and understanding the power of pessimism. Often the best way to understand the impact of light 
is to recognize and experience darkness.